Hey, how's it going? I am Pastor Mike, and I am glad to welcome you to our digital service today. However you're viewing this or listening to this, so thankful that you could be with us today. I want to let you know about a couple things. First, we have our website, goodhope.ag. Gives you all the information of things going on uh, here at the church and things that you can tap into online. Encourage you to check out our website, goodhope.ag. And also, uh, I want to thank you for your faithful giving. We can give online. Uh, You can also give uh, through the Church Center app, not just our website, but we're on the Church Center, so the Church Center app. Or you can write us a letter, 55 Armory Road, Cloquet, Minnesota, 55720. Uh, Thank you for your faithful giving. If you're one who gives, appreciate that so much. It's so great to be part of a church that's financially healthy and strong due to the participation of so many different people. It's just a wonderful thing. Well, now we're going to take some time to worship the Lord. We do that in what we call, you know, our song service or our worship time during the church service where we try to just let go of all the worries and concerns that we've got going on in our heads and just focus on the Lord in song. So the worship team has some songs ready. Uh, You know, if you're in your living room and it's a little weird to stand up and, and worship God in song, you know, then do what it takes. You can sit quietly, but let's just take some time to focus on, to pray, to worship the Lord. And if you want to sing out loud, I encourage you to do that as well. Let's spend some time in worship.
Yes, Jesus. We praise your name. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, for your sacrifice that not, not only frees us from our sins, but frees us from the bondage of our past, frees us from health problems, frees us from addictions. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you are and for all that you've done. And we surrender to you today at the foot of the cross. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where
It's good to worship the Lord. Amen. We're going to take time now for our one minute blessing. Every service we pray together because when God's people pray, it moves the hand of God and it changes the heart of the people who pray. So we need to be people of prayer. That'll make a big difference both in the world and for us. And this weekend, we just got back from Men's Advance, had a group of guys from Good Hope Church and a whole bunch of other churches uh, around the state go down to... Uh, uh, Alexandria, Lake Geneva Christian Center for our annual men's meeting. We call them men's advance because, you know, men don't retreat. Men advance. Uh, kind of fun stuff. But uh, I want to pray now for men to answer the call. You know, one of the things that is just so, so important is for men to truly take their place in the kingdom of God to be leaders, to take responsibility, to be the ones who initiate spiritual growth and development for themselves and for their families. It's just so important, you know, and to understand what that means, not being a, you know, like the few decades ago or generation or two ago, you know, the idea was that, you know, the, the spiritual head of the home gets to be a jerk and that sort of a thing and nobody can do anything about it. And that is not it. You know what I mean? That is not what that's talking about. Um, the reality is, is, is men have a special expectation put on them that they will be held accountable to uh, by God. It's not something that you can exploit. It's an expectation. It's, it's something that we need to rise to the occasion for because God will hold us accountable. So let's pray for men to be strong followers of Jesus and to grab hold of the truth. So pray with me if you would. Heavenly Father, Thank you for all who follow you. And Lord, we pray for everyone to come to a saving knowledge of who you are and to build that relationship with you and grab hold of the blessings of walking with you in this life. But today we specifically lift up men, adult men, who are uh, needing to step into the fullness of their role as followers of you. Lord, I pray that the passive men would reject passivity and grab hold of responsibility and initiate their own spiritual growth and the spiritual growth of those they have influence over. And Lord, also that they would reject violence and bullying and, and that side, that error as well. Uh, so Lord, help us, help men to step into the roles that you have for us, being faithful servants of you uh, and shining your light in a powerful way in this world. So Lord, bless and encourage men to rise to the call. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So we are starting a new series today that we're calling The Good Shepherd. And the motivation I have for starting this series is basically very simple. It's just, let's make sure that we are truly following Jesus and not just following religion, following a pastor or a church or a denomination or something else along those lines, because we need to follow Jesus and follow him directly. You don't have to go through me. You don't have to go through the church. You don't have to go through Christian culture. You don't have to do any of that. You go straight to Jesus. And so let's be followers of Jesus, followers of the good shepherd, not followers of something that can be an imperfect, improper surrogate for Jesus. So that's the idea. Let's pray. We'll get into our new series, The Good Shepherd. Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy scriptures. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father, that we don't have to guess and we don't have to take somebody else's word, but Lord, we can go directly to you. We can open your word. We can see your truth and we can walk in your ways. And Lord, today I pray that you would just make your word living and active in our hearts. You'd give us something good. Lord, each one that is is listening, is viewing this, has got a different need. And Lord, you know exactly what's going on. And so, Lord, I pray by your Holy Spirit, you would meet each one and give us exactly what we need. Speak to our hearts and help us to take a step forward in our understanding of you, in our faith in you, in our service to you, in overcoming the obstacles in our life, in gaining freedom. Lord, whatever it might be, help us to each one take a step up, a step forward today. In Jesus' 
Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, so I'm excited about this series. The Good Shepherd will go into uh, Resurrection Sunday, into Easter with that, and we'll go past that a little bit because we're going to talk about just following Jesus, that we are called to follow Jesus. Now, perhaps the most important thing you need to get right in your life is figuring out who to trust. Amen? If you trust the wrong sources, you're going to be led astray. Jesus says, if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall into a ditch. We don't want to fall in the ditch. We don't want to have these problems. We want to trust the right sources. Now, we want to make sure that we trust the right people, that we trust, you know, man, there's so many influences in today's world. I hope I can get this out well because the reality is, is we have all this information. We have all this slanted junk coming at us from all these different angles. And we need to make sure that we're following and believing in and trusting in the right things. And if you haven't figured it out yet, we need to trust in Jesus. (laughs) We need to follow him. And it's more important that you follow Jesus than it is that you even follow me or a church or a denomination or anything along those lines. You know, like, you don't need me to go to heaven. You don't need Good Hope Church. You don't need, you don't need any of that. You need Jesus. And so go follow Jesus. We need to be sure that we're trusting the right sources. If we trust the wrong sources, then that is going to give us problems. And this is, you know, from trusting the wrong people, trusting the wrong media, you know, political or religious leaders. If we're trusting the wrong people, we're going to run into serious problems. Trusting the right sources helps a lot. And of course, the greatest source, the one we can truly trust is Jesus. So this series is all about making sure that we're trusting in and following Jesus. And uh, here's the first level of abstraction. There are people who think they're following Jesus, but they're just following Christian culture. They're just following a pastor. They're just following a church. They might even be following a, a political ideology or you know, internet misinformation and they think they're following Jesus and that's dangerous. So you want to check your heart. You want to look deep and make sure that you're not going the way of say the group of people that you're around, but they're not actually connected deeply with Christ. They're kind of going their own way. They got their own flavor. They got their own direction and you're following with them. And now you're not really following Christ anymore. So we need to make sure that We are not following the wrong sources and thinking we're following Jesus. Now, when I got saved, when I became a believer in Jesus, I came from outside the Christian culture. And let me tell you, there is a very significant Christian culture, subculture in our society. I think it's, it's shrinking now compared to how it was. It was 1988 when I came to be a believer and it was probably, you know, I started to check out the Christian culture a little bit at that point, but I really didn't get involved until like the 90s. Um, It just took me a while. You know, like I've tried to say before, maybe you've heard this, is, uh, um, you know, church didn't bring me to God. God brought me to church. You know, like I, I found the Lord outside of church. And then when I got serious and started to understand what the scriptures teachings were and what it meant to follow Christ, I realized I needed to be part of the group. I needed to be part of the body of Christ. And that meant going to church. It meant being part of the Christian culture, part of all of that. And so now, you know, I've been a believer for over 30 years. I've been a pastor for over 20 years, and I am a big part of Christian culture. I mean, my life is Christian culture. You know, uh, I kind of enjoyed being outside of the Christian culture and being a believer over there because there's some some extra mud and gunk and, you know, in the Christian culture that can distract us away from Jesus, actually. And we don't want that to happen. We want to make sure that we're grabbing a hold of the fullness of following Christ. One thing that 
you know, years ago I realized the problem with organized religion. And here's the problem with organized religion. The problem with organized religion is that it has a tendency to worship itself rather than God. And now that I've been in the church world for a while, and, uh, you know, certain realities are there, like if people are coming to church and giving, then my kids get to go to college, and if they're not, then they don't. You know, like stuff like that. Uh, you know, it, 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 if you're not careful you can get a wrong mentality. And we see this happening in the scriptures with the Pharisees. We see it happening in history with, you know, messed up churches and things like that. When the church becomes about the church or becomes about the senior leader or becomes about something other than God, we've got a real problem. The church needs to be about one thing. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ advancing the kingdom of God, worshiping the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, engaging in the goodness of God, learning the word of God, putting it into practice. Just that's what it's about. If Good Hope Church is about Good Hope Church and the advancement of Good Hope Church, then when I go face the Lord, I'm in a bad, <laughs> it's going to go bad. Because he's going to say, I called you to follow me and to glorify my name, not to glorify your name, and I'm going to be in real trouble. So I want to make sure that we are following Christ because anything else will create a serious, serious problem. And of course, you know, when we follow the wrong things, then they are horrible substitutes for following Jesus. If you follow Christian culture instead of Jesus, you know, like you don't actually read the Bible for yourself. You don't actually put into practice the teachings of Jesus, or the teachings of the New Testament. You don't try to understand what God's will is for your life. You just sort of go along with the crowd in the Christian world. Well, you're going to have a very different experience, and it's going to be something that is a terrible substitute for actually knowing Christ and walking in his ways. So we need to be sure that we are grabbing hold of the good things of God, and following Christ individually, personally. You following Christ, me following Christ, not just sort of going along with the church or what the guy says or Christian culture or, you know, or again, political culture or some weird thing on the internet. Like, we don't want to be following those things. We don't want to be trusting those things. We want to be trusting in Jesus. And I guess 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 is okay. You know, it's in the Bible, so it must be all right. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, the Apostle Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So if you're not really sure, like you're trying to get your bearings on how to follow Christ, the Corinthians were a little bit messed up. They weren't, they thought they were following God, but they were basically misinterpreting some of the theology of freedom and they were just like hey we can sin in all kinds of egregious terrible ways and god doesn't care and so they were off over there and paul is like oh guys what is wrong with you and so he's trying to pull them back in to obedience to christ and he's thinking well if they don't understand it you know follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. He's like, if it's too intangible for you, if it's too difficult to grasp, then just look at me. Let me tell you, even in that, it's dangerous. Because, I don't know, if you're old like me, you remember photocopy machines, you know, now you can just print out stuff whenever you want off your computer. But back then, you know, we had a thing and we had to make a copy of it. You know, you'd have a book and you'd make copies of it. And if you made a copy of a copy, it was, it started to degrade. And if you made a copy of that copy and you did that a few more times and then now it's, it's been copied like eight, 10 times and you're copying that copy, it just, you know, it's crooked on the page. There's all these extra little dots and it just loses a lot of what it was intended to be. And that's what happens if you rely solely on like 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me uh, as I follow Christ. A little bit. You can do that a little bit, but you follow Christ. The goal isn't to follow Paul or to follow Pastor Mike or to follow. You follow Christ. You find out about who Jesus is. You read the scriptures. You try to live it out and find out the challenges that come with that. You do it. 
you follow Christ. It will deteriorate quickly if you're, if you're putting in a surrogate for your connection with Jesus with anyone, any person, any leader, any culture. It's not going to work. So don't ever substitute anything for Christ. I want to go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And there's a very, very important concept here that you have to grab hold of. Because I think too many people can just sort of float along in Christian culture doing what other people are telling them to do. But that's not exactly what the scriptures are talking about. That's not the teachings that we see in the Bible. So here we go. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to Timothy and he's giving him some instructions and then there's something really important that he says in about three-fourths of the way through this. So here we go. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So how many people does God want to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth? All people, you and me and everybody else. Hallelujah for that. So don't think you're barging in on God and you're imposing. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to have a relationship with him. He wants you forgiven and free and living a new life. That's what he wants for you. Verse five, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This, it, this has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. So Paul is here to bring the message of the gospel. What is the message of the gospel that that God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth and that there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. So when it says the man Christ Jesus, that's not denying that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. This is not denying the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, you know, absolutely still true. And that's not what, Paul is saying that there's something wrong with that, but he is pointing out the humanity of Jesus, the man Christ Jesus. We don't go to, like, you don't have to come to me to get right with God. There is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. That is the Lord. That is the Messiah. That's the Son of God. And you can go directly to Jesus. You don't have to go to me and then me to Jesus, and then Jesus intercedes for you uh, to the Father. You, you don't have all of those mediators. It's just one mediator, and it's Jesus. So you go to him. You go to Jesus. You go to the cross. You pray. You know, if you need guidance with that, I'll try to guide you in that. But you don't come to me. You know, you come to Jesus. So there's only one mediator. You must go to him. And this issue of religion getting in the way of people's relationship with God, you know, like Christian culture or religious culture, and this has been an issue for uh, ever, you know, uh, it's been a significant issue because we spend a lot of time in culture. And if you don't spend your own time studying the scriptures and being obedient to the scriptures and praying to the Lord and seeking the wisdom of God and opening your heart to the spirit of God, if you're not doing that one-on-one, -on -one, you and God, if you're not doing that on a regular basis in your life, then all you've got left is Christian culture. And then we get copies of culture and culture and this one influences this and this one influences that. And then it goes down the road and pretty soon it doesn't have a whole lot to do with what it started as and that's it's all over the place jesus had to deal with this in a major way two thousand years ago so let's go to mark chapter seven and we're going to look at what jesus had to deal with this is just one example because there were so many different examples where this happens but this is one in mark chapter seven we're just going to read verses five through eight 
And this is kind of the short version. You can read it in Matthew. It's a little bit longer, but here in Mark uh, 7, starting in verse 5. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? So the the followers of Jesus were not following the ceremonial hand-washing process that was part of their religious tradition, their religious culture. And so the Pharisees and the theologians, the teachers of the law, asked Jesus, you know, hey, and this is accusatory. How come you guys are doing this wrong? Is, is the tone. You know, how come you're not doing it the right way? You're eating with defiled hands. He replied, Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. <laughs> this is a strong reaction. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. A harsh, harsh response when they're saying, hey, we have a religious culture and we all do it this way. And Jesus is saying, yeah, but you know what? Your religious culture has lost touch with God. So I'm not going to follow your religious culture. And in fact, this is a quotation, you know, from Isaiah, verse 6. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. So we're going back hundreds of years back to Isaiah when it was a problem in his day. And now it's a problem in Jesus' day. And thankfully, not a problem today anymore. Well, of course it's a problem today where we get into these uh, kind of ruts and we follow our traditions and we can lose touch with God if we don't stay connected with the mediator, with Jesus, if we don't spend time personally reading the scriptures, trying to put them into practice, seeking God, spending time in prayer, then we're going to uh, start to lose touch. Just like these religious leaders and theologians strayed from God in their religious traditions, that can happen to us too if we're not careful. The thing that's a little bit scary is that these Pharisees and teachers of the law, you know, like that means like pastors and priests and theologians, various religious leaders, they thought they were doing the will of God and walking in the ways of God, but they had replaced the will of God and the ways of God with their own rules. And that can happen to us unaware. We can just sort of wander into that. Like one example, I talked about worship. You know, we have our, our song service we call our worship service. Do you have to sing a song in order to worship God? No, you do not. In our culture, we definitely do a lot of that singing part. And Jesus sang hymns with his disciples, and they sang in the Old Testament. It, you know, it's part of uh, the tradition, and it can be done right and in a worshipful heart. But, you know, for me, I like quiet worship too, where I'm just out in the woods, I'm sitting on a rock somewhere far away from anything, and I'm just honoring and worshiping God in my heart, spending some time in prayer, spending some time worshiping God, just trying to pour my heart out and love the Lord. Like, you can do that just quietly. You can do that through service. You can worship God in so many different ways. Uh, and so don't feel trapped by Christian culture where you got to sing a song. As you're just not a musical person. You just, you've never enjoyed music. You don't really connect with it, you know, well, that doesn't mean that you have an inability to worship God. You can still worship God because it's a matter of the heart, not a matter of the singing voice, you know, or musical capacity. So that's something where, you know, if you, if you don't realize that the culture has a lot of music in it, but you can worship God just fine without music, then, you know, you might end up making a, a you know, feeling a disconnect when you don't need to feel a disconnect. Because just go straight to God and do the thing that he wants. 
wants worship, and you can do that. Just worship God. You don't need music. So these people back then thought they were following God, but they weren't. And we need to be wise and make sure that we don't stray and think we're following God and then expect other people to do things the way we do things because that's how you really worship God or that's how you really do it. You know, you got to have loud music. Well, you don't have to. And now we're fighting for something that has nothing to do with a true connection with God. So let's go to our text, the Good Shepherd, what we're talking about here uh, in the sermon series. So that's the Gospel of John chapter 10. In the Gospel of John chapter 10, Jesus is dealing with some religious dysfunction. John chapter 9 is all about weird religious dysfunction. And again, you know, my little tongue-in-cheek joke, boy, it sure is great that weird religious dysfunction went away thousands of years ago. No, we still have weird religious dysfunction today. You know, this day we have weird religious dysfunction. It will be around tomorrow. Till Jesus comes, we're going to have to deal with this. So we have to pay attention. We have to maintain our relationship with God and not substitute church, religion, religious leaders, some, you know, TV, internet pastor guy or whatever. Like we can't substitute that stuff in for a real relationship with the Lord. So Jesus is looking at weird religious dysfunction and he starts to deal with it here in chapter 10. So we'll start with the first part of this. We'll, we'll continue on this in the series, of course. But today we're going to look at verses 1 through 6 of John chapter 10. And uh, here we go. 10 verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never followers follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. So what was he telling them? Well, what Jesus basically, you know, we'll look at it a little deeper, but the first look at it is basically this. Like, you know, you guys are messing this up. <laughs> uh, and it, Jesus is the way. He's the good shepherd. He is going to call out the sheep. But then the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, those people, he's like, you guys are messing it up. You're, you're uh, climbing in by some other way. You're a thief and a robber. You're not really shepherds of the sheep. You know, you're leading people in the wrong direction. You're doing harm. Uh, but Jesus says, no, nah, I'm, I'm leading them the right way. You know, and so that's the basic thing that he's talking about is he's making a contrast between he as the son of God leading people into connection with God versus false religion leading people away from God into religious culture. And just on a side note, if you're not a believer in Jesus, you must focus on the difference between religious culture, which does not accurately represent God, and God himself. Two very different things. Make sure that you make a separation in your mind between those two things, because when you criticize religious culture, that has nothing to do with God. God is who he is, so you can have all kinds of fun making fun of this. Go try to find out about actually who God is. That's a whole different thing. So you want to be able to do that. Hopefully that'll help you. So, what's Jesus trying to say here in verses 1 through 5? Let's, let's break it down a little bit more. Uh, first point is that some people who are trying to lead the sheep don't belong there. <laughs> Simple point number one. You know, uh, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. There are thieves and robbers. There are problem people trying to lead the sheep, trying to influence the sheep, trying to mess things up, or they 
think they're helping, but they're actually messing things up. Some people who are trying to lead the sheep don't belong there. And the obvious indication would be it's the Pharisees that are trying to lead the sheep, uh, but they don't belong there. They're doing the wrong thing. I want to look at a couple other things that Jesus had to say from Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Jesus says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, They are ferocious wolves. Watch out for false prophets. And then in Mark chapter 13, Jesus says something similar, but it's going for into the future. Mark 13, 5 and 6, Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. So Jesus is saying in the future, Many will be deceived because they'll trust the wrong people. So he's saying, watch out that no one deceives you. Watch out for false prophets. Why would Jesus say, watch out for false prophets and watch out that no one deceives you? It's because you have, they're out there. (laughs) The the deceiving people, the false prophets, the false teachers, false religion, you know, and then all the other sources that are out there too that are false. It's all over the place. You got to watch out. You take responsibility for that and you watch out. No, don't just be a gullible Christian person who just believes everything anybody says as long as they quote a Bible verse. You know, don't be that person. Watch out for false prophets. They they quote scripture too. Watch out for those who claim to be someone that they're not. Don't be deceived. You got to be discerning. Follow Jesus, not, not that other influence. Follow Jesus. All right. So some people who are trying to lead the sheep don't belong there. Number two, point number two. The good shepherd doesn't need any tricks or side maneuvers, just the truth. You know, the shepherd walks in by the gate. The gatekeeper opens the door. Hey, come on in. There's no tricks. They're not climbing in the side. You know, Jesus just sort of shows up and says, come with me. Doesn't need any gimmicks doesn't need any tricks, doesn't need any manipulation, doesn't need, which is one of the main things that false religion will use, is just, you know, relational leverage. You know, don't let the group down. You know, this is how we do it. Don't, don't fail us. Don't do something, you know, like, don't do something different. Don't leave the group, you know, like that relational leverage. Like, Jesus doesn't need relational leverage. He just walks right in the gate and says, hey, sheep, how you doing? And the sheep like, hey. I watched a bunch of videos on shepherds calling their sheep just because I wanted to, to see how this works. And uh, uh, there wasn't the perfect video, but there were videos of people trying to call the sheep. You know, they're doing some experiments like, hey, sheep, come here, sheep. And then the shepherd would do the shepherd's call and then the sheep would all come running, you know, and it was kind of neat to watch. And the, the ones who sneak in, the ones who come in a side direction, you know, the sheep aren't going to listen to them, but the, the shepherd doesn't need any tricks. They don't need any. They just make the call and everybody comes. The sheep come. And so the good shepherd who is Jesus, you know, he doesn't need any tricks. And in the Christian world, you know, like, uh, there's all the coolness factor, you know, like you got to be the coolest thing ever. And then people will come and hang out with you or whatever. Like Jesus didn't need to be cool. He didn't need to be hip. He didn't need to be on the cutting edge. He didn't have to have the newest song and the best worship team. Or like he didn't need any of that. He just stood on the truth of who he was and what God's plan was. That was it. The good shepherd doesn't need any tricks or side maneuvers, just the truth. Jesus walks in and calls you into the family of God, and it's just that simple. It doesn't involve all this other stuff. Jesus just walks into your life, says, hey, I've got something good for you. But it's going to involve some changes in your life, changes in your heart, changes in the way you see the world and you see people why don't you come with me and I'll teach you? That's what Jesus does. There's no bait and switch. 
There's not, none of this confusing junk. He's calling you to a new life. Now, it's going to involve a new life, so don't think that's bait and switch. He, you know, he's, he calls us into living differently. But he, it's just a simple presentation of Jesus coming into your life and saying, come follow me. And then we set the old down. We go follow Jesus. We learn his ways. We do it. Then point number three from this first part of John 10 that we read is the sheep will trust the good shepherd, but not strangers. So we already talked about watch out for false prophets. Make sure nobody deceives you. You know, we have to take an active role in that. But what Jesus is saying here is basically that people can smell a rat. You know, dysfunctional religion is something people will be like, eh, you're like, there's something wrong here. They can tell. They're not going to follow that. And if you have been through various problems in your life and you've been manipulated a lot and there's been abuse in your life and that sort of a thing, and so you kind of got used to being manipulated and controlled and pushed around, and so now you think it's normal, let me tell you, it's not normal. <laughs> It's not right. It's not good. If there's a bunch of red flags, then you need to get out of that yucky situation because you don't need people. You need Jesus. So just follow Jesus. You don't have to follow manipulative religion, you know, all that yucky stuff. You don't need to support that. Just walk with Jesus. Follow Jesus. He's the good shepherd. He will not fail you. So then the last verse that we read, you know, the, uh, the Pharisees were not picking up what Jesus was laying down. So he describes it in greater detail, which we'll get to next time uh, as we continue in John chapter 10. But here's the deal. We're going we're gonna, to, you know, we're, we're coming in to land the plane here. I got one more section of scripture I want to read. But somehow I wish I could make sure I was always following the right sources and that you could always follow the right sources. You could trust the trustworthy and discern when someone's not trusty, when a message is not trustworthy. If you could, if we could all see that clearly and perfectly, wouldn't that be awesome? Jesus describes this as having eyes to see and ears to hear. Like there are some people who just can't see it. Some people who just can't hear it. They're easily deceived. They're often confused. They trust the wrong sources. I don't want that for you and I don't want that for me. So let's pray. Let's pray for the ability to be able to supernaturally see the difference. And the section of Scripture I want to go to as our closing section of Scripture is Matthew chapter 13. Something that years ago, when I read this for the first time, like my eyes got big and I'm like, oh, you know, because it was the disciples asked Jesus a great question. The disciples asked Jesus a great question. And what was the question? So let's go to Matthew 13, starting in verse 10. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? I thought this is a fantastic question because like if you're trying to describe the goodness of God, why would you hide it in riddles? You know, like it's confusing to people. It's a great question. Just maybe try to be more clear and straightforward. But so there, why do you speak to the people in parables? Verse 11, Jesus replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Back to Isaiah again. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's hearts has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Now for me, 
there's one little angle in here that I'm most interested in, and that is how do you go from the calloused, closed ears, closed eyes, unable to hear, unable to see, how do you go from that to the person who can open their heart to God, have eyes to see and ears to hear? Because I believe this is not just a condemnation of people like this is where you are and you're stuck there, but that you can go from the one to the other. This people's hearts has become calloused. It's going to involve softening our hearts before God. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. It's going to mean opening our eyes. So I want to pray. We don't have much time left. I want to pray that uh, we could grab hold of the blessing. Of, ha- of our eyes being able to see and our ears being able to hear. I want to pray just a supernatural impartation of that because I don't think I can explain it, but I know God can do that in our hearts. So let's pray and let's go for it. Heavenly Father, we want to have ears to hear and eyes to see. Help us to break the calluses off our hearts, have our hearts melt in front of you and trust you. You are a trustworthy source. Lord, if we've been burned by religion, false teachers, false prophets, uh, those who deceive, if we've been burned by that, Lord, let us not callous our hearts towards you. Because that's not you. Let us open our hearts to you. Open our eyes. Open our ears. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and that we would be able to hear, that we would be able to see. Lord, bless our eyes as eyes that can discern and see the difference between a trustworthy source and an untrustworthy source, between who you are and maybe religious culture or any other deceiving force. Lord, help us to see. Lord, bless our ears to be able to hear, hear your voice so we can follow you. Not all the distractions and the ideas and the thoughts of our culture, but Lord, truly hearing your voice and like your sheep, following your voice. So Lord, this is what we ask, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear so that we would not be deceived, but we would walk with you, following you, learning your ways, and knowing your truth. So Lord, bless us with this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I hope you can be with us for the rest of this series, The Good Shepherd. Again, thank you for being here. If you've got a prayer need, you can email our prayer team at prayer at goodhope.ag and they will get to you in a day or two, maybe right away, and uh, email back and pray over your prayer request. But hey, from all of us here at Good Hope Church, to you and yours, God bless. Have a wonderful day.